I want to share with us a recipe for strong and healthy churches, healthy nations, healthy families, healthy businesses. If I could show you a way to have a strong and healthy church, family, business, nation, wouldn't you like to hear about that? Yeah. All right, we're, we're going we're gonna to talk about that. Uh, but to set it up, I want to read a scripture from Judges chapter 21, verse 25. And this passage is actually sort of a mantra throughout the book of Judges. You read it more than one time. In the book of Judges, it says over and over and over again, in those days, Israel had no king. All the people did whatever was right in their own eyes. The people had no king, and everyone just kind of did what was right in their own eyes. They lacked leadership, and they lacked purpose. How many know that we are in a crisis of leadership in our country? We've got a leadership crisis. I don't know if you've been following things, but the favorability ratings of, uh, of Congress are at all-time lows. 26% have a favorable view of Congress. The Supreme Court now has a 54% unfavorable view. The president's approval rating are hovering below 40%. The president before him was hovering below or right at 40%. Uh, some of it is because there's such a partisan uh, divide in, in our country. But it's not just in the political realm. Only 25% of people today have a positive opinion of pastors. 25% have a very negative opinion, and 48 are indifferent. Of those who attend church weekly, 37% of the people that attend church weekly say that pastors are very influential. There's a huge amount of skepticism and indifference. And, and when it comes to, like, everyone did that which is right in their own eyes, how many have heard the word, my truth? Everyone's got my truth. Everyone, everyone's doing things as they see fit. Confidence in economic leaders, like the chair of the Federal Reserve, have plummeted below 40% as well. There seems to be no unifying purpose in our country. Everyone on social media has a platform and broadcast to the world their ideas. This week on TikTok, Americans were on there praising Osama bin Laden's letter to America on TikTok. We're living in, we're living in, in crazy times right now where everyone can say whatever they want to and everyone is sort of self-leading and, and, and doing whatever they want to. It's very much like the time of Judges. But when this happened, God would raise up a particular judge to sort of correct that wrong. And so we're going to read today from one of them, and I've asked Melanie if she would help me read from Judges chapter 4. Judges chapter 4. It's a great story. Uh, the kids are in the other room. This is an R-rated story. So just get ready, all right? But it's in the Bible, so we're reading it, all right? So Judges chapter 4. Go ahead, Melanie. After Ehud's death, the Israelites again did evil in the Lord's sight. So the Lord turned them over to King Jabin of Hazar, a Canaanite king. The commander of his army was Sisera, who lived in Hagarth Hogim. Sisera had 900 iron chariots ruthlessly oppressed the Israelites for 20 years. All right, I want you to stop right He's got 900 chariots. He's got weapons of mass destruction. He's a terrorist. He's been terrorizing Israel for 20 years. Go ahead. Then the people of Israel cried out to the Lord for help. Deborah, the wife of Lapidoth, was a prophet who was judging Israel at the time. She would sit under the palm of Deborah between Ramah and Bethel at the hill country of Ephraim, and the Israelites would go to her for judgment. I want to stop right there. Notice it said the Bible said there was no king in Israel. There's no palace. There's no palace. Deborah does not have a palace that she leads from. She's just got a palm tree. I want to just tell you, you don't need a palace to lead. Amen. God can lead with just a palm tree. Amen. Amen. Whatever he's got. So, so Deborah's under a palm tree. And she's leading. Go ahead, Melanie. One day she sent for Barak, son of Abraham, who lived in Kadesh in the land of Naphtali. She said to him, 
This is what the Lord, the God of Israel, commands you. Call out 10,000 warriors from the tribes of Naphtali and Zebulon and Mount Tabor. And I will call out Sisera, commander of Jabin's army, along with his chariots and warriors to the Kishon River. And there I will give you the victory over them. Barak told her, I will go, but only if you go with me. All right, I want to stop right there. So, so you get the picture. God's um, prepare. He's calling uh, the armies together uh, to come against Sisera, who is the foreign, who is the foreign army, and Barak is the commander of the army. And uh, when Deborah tells Barak what the Lord is telling uh, him to do, he says, "Okay, I'll go, but only if Deborah goes with me. I'll go, but only if that woman goes with me." Now, I want to give him a hard time for being a little bit wimpy, but I would say that there's times in my life when I say to God, I'll go, but please send Melanie with me. <clears throat> right? Amen. How many know what I'm talking about? Amen. All right, keep reading, Melanie. Very well, she replied. I will go with you. But you will receive no honor in this venture, for the Lord's victory over Sisera will be at the hands of a woman. All right, it's going to be ladies' day. All right. <laughs> go ahead. So Deborah went with Barak to Kadesh. At Kadesh, Barak called together the tribes of Zebulun and Naphtali, and 10,000 warriors went up with him. Deborah also went with him. Now Haber, the Kenite, a descendant of Moses, a brother-in-law, Hoba, had moved away to the other members of his tribe, with other members of his tribe, and pitched his tent by the oak of Zanim near Kadesh. Okay, now he gives a little odd detail to this story. He talks about this guy named Heber the Kenite. Heber the Kenite has left the other Kenites, and he's living near where King Jabin and the Canaanites are living. He's living there, but the Bible wants us to know something significant about this. Hold this thought. He's a relative of Moses. He's a relative of Moses. And because, and by the way, the Kenites, the, the Kenites, when Moses left Egypt and, and he went out into the wilderness, and he finds those nine girls around a well. These were Kenites. And, and his father-in-law becomes Jethro. Jethro is a Kenite. Some of the Kenites actually went to the promised land with them. So they, they weren't Israelites, but they were, they were friends of Israelites. You need to know that. Keep going. When Sisera was told Barak, son of Abonam, had gone to Mount Tabor, he called for 900 of his cast iron chariots and all of his warriors, and they marched down to Hashroth Haganim to the Kishon River. Then Deborah said to Barak, get ready. All right, I think, I think that Deborah was like the great-great-grandmother of T.D. Jakes. She says, get ready, get ready, get ready, get ready. All right, go ahead. <laughs> get ready. This is the day the Lord will give you the victory over Sisera, for the Lord is marching ahead of you. So Barak led his 10,000 warriors down the slopes of Mount Tabor in battle. When Barak attacked, the Lord threw Sisera and all of his chariots and warriors into a panic. Sisera leaped down from his chariot and escaped on foot. Then Barak chased the chariots and the enemy all the way to Hashem, killing all the Sisera's warriors. Not a single one was left alive. Meanwhile, Sisera ran to the tent of Jael, the wife of Heber, the Kenite. Oh, oh, wait, 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 wait. The wife of, goes into the tent of the wife of Heber, the Kenite. Remember, these are Moses' relatives. So they've got sympathy to the Israelites, even though they're not Israelites. Keep going, Mel. Because Heber's family was on friendly terms with King Jabin. Ah, Hazor. so Heber's family is on friendly terms terms with King Jabin, so therefore Sisera thinks I'm safe because my king has friendly relationships with Heber the Kenite. So, so go ahead, Mel. Jael went out to meet Sisera and said to him, come into my tent, sir. Come in. Don't be afraid. So he went into her tent and she covered him with a blanket. Please give me some water. He said, I'm thirsty. So she gave him some milk from the leather bag and covered him again. Yeah, how many know that uh, what what milk does to a person? I don't, I don't know about any of you. Any of you like me, like right before bed, sometimes a bowl of cereal or a little bit of milk just kind of just kind of puts you to sleep. So she, he's he's like, I, I, I'm so thirsty. I need some water. She goes, Oh, now milk is like ancient Nyquil. All right, so she gives him she gives him milk. All right, keep going. 
<laughs> Stand at the door of the tent, he told her. If anyone comes and asks you if there's anyone here, say no. But when Sisera fell asleep from exhaustion, Jael quietly crept up to him with a hammer and a tent peg in her hand. Close your ears if your kid's in this place. Go ahead. Then she drove the tent peg through his temple and into the ground, and so he died. Ouch. All right. <laughs> when Barak came looking for Sisera, Jael went out to meet him. She said, come on, and I will show you the man you were looking for. So, she, so he followed her into the tent and found Sisera lying there dead with the tent peg through his temple. So on the day, on that day, the Lord, uh, Israel, saw God defeat Jabin and the Canaanite king. And from that time on, Israel became stronger and stronger against King Jab Jabin until they finally destroyed him. Thank you to our reader. Thank you, Melanie. <laughs> Told you it was an R-rated story, right? I warned you ahead of time. But uh, he was a terrorist and, and got treated uh, in, in that fashion. It's re really interesting if you study... Um, Judges chapter 4, and then you read chapter 5, which we won't take time to do. Chapter 5 retells chapter 4, but chapter 4 was the narrative. It does it in prose, but in chapter 5, it's the song of Deborah. So Deborah and, and um, uh, they're so excited after what happened that, that Deborah and Barak start singing, and they sing the song, and they tell the story. And the first line of the song is, and, uh, is Israel's, on the day that Deborah and Barak, son of Abinoam, sang this song, Israel's leaders took charge, and the people gladly followed, praise the Lord. Israel's leaders took charge, and the people gladly followed, praise the Lord. Often, when a song is written, the first line of the song really explains the entire song and everything else follows from that first line. So this is the line of the song that you need to know. That when the leaders took charge and the people gladly followed, all I can say about that is, praise the Lord. I would argue that in this one line is embedded the recipe for a strong nation, strong families, strong churches, strong businesses. There's really only two things required. And the first thing required is this, that leaders would lead. Number one, the reason they were having a hard time during this time period, there was no king in Israel. People did that which was right in their own eyes. Leaders wouldn't lead. Romans 12, 2 says this, if God has given you leadership ability, take the responsibility seriously. We need in our culture leaders to lead. And there's ways in which these leaders should lead. Number one, we need leaders that will lead intentionally. There's a leadership crisis in our story. Deborah has to go to the commander of the army and basically beg him to go to war. This leader is not leading. And so she does. There's a leadership crisis. Come on, Barak, she says. Get off your duff. It's time. We, we, we've been terrorized for 20 years. 20 years is enough. I, I was just thinking, you know, if Moses doesn't lead, Israel is still stuck in Egypt. If David doesn't lead, they never become the great nation that they are. If Martin Luther King doesn't lead, segregation wins the day. If Mother Teresa doesn't lead, the poor in Calcutta die of starvation. If Life Church doesn't lead in our neighborhood, scores of Emerald Youth kids won't have a chance. It's time for leaders to lead. How many books never get written because leaders won't lead? How many businesses never get started because leaders won't lead? How many small groups never get started because, because uh, leaders are, are just content to stay where they are and not start another new group? 
You know, you know that if every small group that we had, uh, if there was a new leader that rose up within every small group, we would double. Uh, be, I know that because I'm good at math. We would double next year how many we ha- small groups we have. Amen. If leaders would lead. I want to just take a moment to tell you how thankful I am for the leaders of Life Church. In some ways, the story of our building a new church is a lot like the story that we read. And I'll even give you a kind of a funny way as a like. It kind of started with a woman. And here's what I mean by that. My daughter, Natalie, she doesn't have a title in the church. She isn't on the board. She's not an elder. Uh, But she's got, like Deborah, she's got a palm tree. She's got a palm tree and she can lead. And last last Christmas, we were, uh, uh, as a family, sitting around the Christmas tree and opening up Christmas gifts. And Natalie's like, Dad, I can't wait to show you what I got you for Christmas. I can't wait to show you what I got for Christmas. And and, and, and she, she takes me downstairs and out onto our porch. And she's got this model made of a brand new church here on Cedar Lane. I didn't ask her to do that. She didn't have some official title to do that. She's just sick of hearing me talk about it. (laughs) She's just tired of of hearing uh, talk about someday. Someday, wouldn't it be nice? Wouldn't it be nice if we fill in the you? She's like, shut up, Dad. Merry Christmas. (laughs) And that model that sits out there in the lobby right now, that, was, that started the whole thing. And if you, had, if you had been a fly on the wall of our Christmas, I bawled like a baby receiving that gift. It was a gift that came with some requirements. It was a gift that came with, come on, Dad, step up and lead, right? So I remember taking it to the elders, and I took it to the elders, and Uh, For those of you who don't know, Tom and Daphne, Eulen, Jana, myself, Melanie, Chris and Nisha, uh, and we'd been growing together as a group of elders in this church. And and you know, there's some some churches that have elders, and elderships can be a place where dreams go to die. But thankfully, it's not true at Life Church. When we brought that idea with them, but now, now by the way, on every eldership team, there's different personalities, and that's a good thing. And just to be real transparent about it, Tom Blevins would be the first one to tell you he's the cautious type, and you need those guys as elders. Tom's the one that makes sure that we're fiscally conservative, that you know that we really think things through, that you know that, uh, and 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 so we were we were casting this vision about what if we started talking to architects, you know, about about moving the ball forward on this, and and all of a sudden, cautious Tom pipes up and says, I make a motion that we start talking to architects. And his wife said, I knew it was God when Tom made the motion. (laughs) Lead intentionally. It's time for leaders in our nation, in families, amen, to step up and lead. Another way that leaders need to lead, though, is courageously. There was a courage story in this problem. Barack said, I'll do it, but only if Debbie goes with me, right? I'm, I'm, not, I'm not going to this battle without, without Deborah. There's, there, there's a courage problem. But, you know, sometimes I think we cast courage wrong. We, we cast courage somehow as bravado. You know, the, 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 to be courageous means that you're talking trash and all that. Sometimes courage means you just don't quit. Sometimes courage means you show up when you don't feel like showing up. Amen? Sometimes that's what courage, courage is moving ahead in spite of our fears and trusting God to catch us. I appreciate the courage that I've seen during this time. I I appreciated the courage of Dan Rutherford during this series who preached on Caleb moving into the promised land. Uh, even though he was old and said, we are able to do it. I was personally inspired by the courage of that message, Dan. Um, Jana, when she preached on our response to the vision, my mother was watching online when Jana preached that, and she called me and she said, who was that woman? What a great message. 
It was a courageous message to say, Pastor Phil's cast a vision, and how are we going to respond to that vision? We need preachers like Chris Irwin, who embodies courage by the life that they've chosen to live in foreign environments, and Nathan and Sarah, who've left it all to become workers in Central Asia. We need courage like uh, leaders like Madison Grant, who could be a leader in any field that she chose to, but she's choosing to further the kingdom of God by being a blessing to young people through Emerald Youth. We need courageous leaders like Denise and Donovan who give their time, talent, and treasure to seeing God's kingdom come here. Amen. Amen. We need courageous preachers like Melanie whose content is always highlighted by a life so well lived. It's dangerous to bring up names in a message like this because, because I am thankful for every leader in this church. But we need leaders who will not look at poll numbers. Come on now. We need leaders who won't say, our army is too small. The church is too small. The obstacles are too big. 300,000 is too much. Those iron chariots are too much for us. The cost is too great. Interest rates are too high. Ecclesiastes 11, 4 through 6 said that farmers who wait for perfect weather will never plant. And if they watch every cloud, they'll never harvest. We need leaders that will lead in spite of the current conditions. Amen. Leaders who will lead from the voice of the Lord, not from the voice of the fears that are all around us. Amen. Amen. So we need leaders that will lead intentionally and that will lead courageously. We also need leaders who will lead expansively. I'm really tired of all the partisanship in our country and the way that people are fighting one another all of the time. If we want strong and healthy churches, we are going to have to be a part of churches where all of us don't look alike. Come on now. A lot of times when I'm, when I'm driving in rideshare, I, I get like a two minute elevator speech. They'll, they'll find out I'm a pastor. I'm two minutes from their destination. And, I, and they'll ask me, well, what is your church belief? And so I got like a one-liner that I use. I say, we agree on the big stuff and we don't fight about the little stuff. Amen. Amen. We need leaders that are expansive enough. Well, let, let me tell you, that doesn't mean that we're, we're wishy-washy or mealy-mouthy. There's some, there's some things. I'll go to the mat for you. I believe that the Bible is the Word of God. I believe that Jesus is the Son of God. I believe that you must be born again. Amen. I believe in baptism. I believe that every believer is filled with the Holy Spirit and, and should live Spirit-led lives. Amen. Amen. I believe that Jesus is coming again. Amen. But whether you're pre-tribulation, mid-tribulation, or after, I don't give a rip. Amen. there's there's, There's a lot of things that churches divide over and people divide over. We need leaders that will lead expansively. Amen. Even in Congress, we need people that will listen to each other. Amen. This week in Congress, we had, we had, a, we had a, a senator, you know, and, a, and, a, and the head of Teamsters squaring it off, you know, right there, right there in, in the Senate and in the House, you know, uh, uh, one, of the, one of the guys from Knoxville said, I got, a, I got an elbow, a clean shot to the ribs, you know, right there in Congress. We've got to, we, we've got to lead expansively. Amen. Amen. That's the truth anyway. Amen. Amen. I heard one preacher in Nashville yell at his congregation and say, if you're a Democrat, get out of here. On the opposite political spectrum, there are churches that are having drag queens preach on Sunday mornings as an expression of their progressive politics. When the church becomes a political organization, it loses its power. If the church hitches its wagon to political parties, we will lose our power. The church needs to be able to speak truth to power no matter who's in office. Amen. We need to be hearing, uh, the scripture says this, some trust in chariots and some in horses, but we will remember the name of the Lord our God. Amen. Some trust in elephants and some trust in donkeys, but we will look to the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Amen. Amen. 
And I say that as one that has a political view. I just think that you have a right to be wrong. No, just kidding. <laughs> Amen. We all have our politics. We all have our biases. We all think, and I, and I, and I believe in voting. I'm a, I'm, I'm a proud American. I love all of those things. But when we get in the church, amen, depending on how you raised or what race you are, you may not see things just like I do. Amen. Amen. The last thing I want to say about leadership is lead with integrity. Don't let anyone tell you that a person's life doesn't matter. How what we believe is embodied matters. Now, I know there's no perfect people. So we're not looking for perfect leaders, but we need leaders who are interested in their private lives matching their public lives. Have we given up on on looking for leaders with integrity? You know, the last words that David ever spoke on the earth the last words that David ever spoke on, this, on the earth were this. The one who rules righteously, who rules in the fear of God, is like the light of morning of sunrise. Like a morning without clouds, like the gleaming of the sun on the new grass after rain. Did you see how pretty it was when you drove to church this morning? The sky was blue. It was such a beautiful day this morning. David said, that's what it's like when a leader leads with integrity. Give us men and women of integrity to lead our churches, our governments, our businesses, and our homes. Amen. Amen. The number one thing, we need leaders to lead. And the second thing that we need is we need people to follow. Now, Now, I know how that can be heard. That can be heard like there's Two tiers of people. There's the leaders and the followers. But let me just say this. Every leader that's a good leader is a good follower. One of the best, one of the best qualities of a great leader is they are a great follower. Do you know that Doug McMillan, my, my, my daughter works for the Walmart Corporation. Doug McMillan is the CEO of Walmart. You know what he's doing this morning? He's handing out bulletins at his local church. Amen. Amen. The CEO of Walmart worldwide is handing out bulletins at his lo- Why? Because anyone who's a great leader also has to be a great follower. Amen. Part of my role is leadership, but you know, I'm a part of a small group where I'm not the leader. And, and, and so Joel is, is, is leading the small group that I'm in. When I'm on the praise team, Tanner's the leader. If he thinks I'm saying too much, shut up, Phil. No, just kidding. Uh, uh, but, but I'm under his authority when I'm in that position. Every leader needs to be a good follower. We need followers who will follow courageously. It takes guts to follow a dream. We didn't get all 10,000 of the people's names that followed Barack and Deborah down the mountain, but those guys had guts. They went up against 900 iron chariots and all of that. They had guts. We need, we need followers in our congregation that, that don't say, Really? Our congregation, we're too small. 300,000, it's too much. No, we need followers that say, we can do it, pastor, amen. We're behind you all the way, amen. We can do this thing, amen, amen. We can see the vision come to pass. I'm so thankful for this church. Not all of us have the same means, but I sense so much courage in this church. Not equal giving, but equal sacrifice. People, uh, people that, that have next to nothing. Some, some people are volunteering time that can't give any money. Things that we would have had to pay money for. They're volunteering so that we, can, that, that, that we can see this dream come to pass. So following courageously. Following willingly. Not like, okay, I guess I'll follow. <laughs> now put me in, coach. I, I'd be glad to do that. Doug McMillan, yeah, I'll be, glad to, I'll be glad to hand out bulletins. I'll be part of the team. 
Use me. Can I just tell you this morning, God is more interested in your, in your availability than your ability. Amen. 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 He's not near as interested in your ability as he is your availability. I, I, I want to serve every Sunday. Man, even when I go to visit other churches when I'm out of town, I just... I like go up and greet people, and I'm like, man, this is a great church. You ought to come here if you're a visitor. You know, I'm, 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 I'm volunteering when I go to other churches. Amen. Because there's, there's something about, about being, being willing and, and, and the excitement it is to serve. I don't look at what I do in the church as work. You know that if you are, if you are doing something you'll love, you'll never work again, right? If you are serving in an area that you're gifted in, it won't be work for you. It's a beautiful thing when, 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 when I walk in and I see people that are serving willingly. I, I didn't know what to expect last Sunday. I didn't know what to expect. We, we put out a vision that seemed a little bit ridiculous to me. And to see the way that this church came through, I wanted to preach this message and say, I am so proud of you. I am so proud of your willingness. Here's the beautiful thing. I don't know what anybody gave. Uh, and that just gives me great freedom. I don't have to treat certain people special and certain people not as special. Every one of you are special. All I know is all of us together did it. Amen. 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 The last thing I want to say is follow joyfully. Follow joyfully. Worship team, if you'd come. You didn't just participate. You did it joyfully. Have you ever met our drummer, Kevin? Have you ever had a bad day, Kevin? He's like the most joyful guy I know. I enjoyed during worship today, Kevin, and times you weren't playing. I just saw your arms up, big smile on your face, worshiping the Lord. Mike and Christy May. And not only do I see you serving, I see you serving joyfully. I know you like the Tennessee Volunteers. I know you got to be disappointed with yesterday's loss. And yet you came in with a smile on your face today, serving the Lord. Victoria Bass. What a joy. I, I call Victoria Bass the face of Life Church. When you walk in and see Victoria, it's hard to be in a bad mood because you do it joyfully. Our production team, he's not here today, but Jack in the back. I call him Jack, Jack in the back. Sits in the back all the time. Joyful. Bradley back there today, joyfully serving. And, and new at that, learning all of that stuff. And he's got a hundred things coming at him today, doing it with joy. Dan and on sound, and Dan on the cameras today, doing what you do joyfully. The worship team coming and joyfully. Don't you love watching Tammy play the piano? Amen. She plays with a smile. And, and, and if you ever talk to Tammy, she talks with, a, with, with joy in her voice. There's just joy in her. Can I just tell you this morning, it's a joy to be your pastor. If you, haven't, if you haven't heard me say, I love being your pastor. It's a joy to serve alongside of you. It's a joy to dream these dreams together and to see these things come to pass. I told you uh, last week that, you know, what I'm doing for the, for the um, uh, campaign is I'm using my driving for the next three years, uh, up to $50,000 I'm, I'm giving. And so everything I'm doing now and my driving for for Uber and Lyft, I'm, I'm doing that for the, um, for the give it, fill in the U. And so this was the first week that I started doing that. And, and, and I told you I had a test of my thing, but my, my Prius has never had a problem. Just the week before, everything went to pot. I mean, the, the head gasket blew. And so while he's fixing the head gasket, he's got the whole car torn apart. He said, well, you had the original fuel pump, so I replaced that, replaced the timing chain, all of this news. 3,000 bucks, you know, was, was, was my, was my uh, car bill. But I got all that paid for, and this week I started doing that. And, and, I, and, I, and I just sort of prayed 
that when I started this, that first of all, it's fun because because I'm, I'm now I'm just doing it for the, so every every penny I'm getting now I'm doing it for the church. But I, I had I had riders in my car that had come for the game on Friday night, and it was their first Uber ride ever, and they were like, "Man, this ride costs thirty bucks. How much how much do you get for it?" And I just it was, I had not said this to anybody else, but I just kind of felt like the Holy Spirit prompted me to just tell, well, I'm actually not getting anything for this. I said, I'm, I'm using this because we've got kids in our neighborhood that really need a bigger place uh, to expand Emerald Youth. And I'm doing this so that, so that we can go from 30 kids to 100 kids that we're serving. And, I'm pat- and they said, we're believers. And they got excited about the story and they knew that everything that they were given was going to that. So he got done. He hands me a $20 bill for a tip. And then another, and I had like four of them in the car. Then another lady in the back, she hands me 20 bucks. <laughs> we just took an offering right there in the car, man. There was, just a, there was just a spirit of giving that broke out in the car. And I'm just, I'm just going to be amazed as we go along what God's going to do, miracles that are going to happen, and, and just doing it with joy. And so um, when, when I think about this song, I, I need a microphone. I, I told you that this was the story, but after the story, they sang the story. And so when I think about just knocking down all of those chariots, and I just walked out And I saw Osama bin Laden with a tent peg through his head, right? I saw Sisera, who'd been terrorizing us for 20 years, and Barack and Deborah get excited. And and so I kind of heard it like this. Huh? 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 Oh, when the leaders lead and the people follow, praise the Lord. Oh, when the leaders lead and the people follow, praise the Lord. When there's power in the pulpit and passion in the pews, ain't nothing that the church can't do. When the leaders lead and the people follow, praise the Lord. You want to stand up, sing it with me? Oh, when the leaders lead and the people follow, praise the Lord. It's the first line. Uh When the leaders lead and the people follow, praise the Lord. Oh, when there's power in the pulpit and passion in the pew. Ain't nothing that the church can't do when the leaders lead and the people follow. High five your neighbor around you. All right, all right, yeah. When the leaders lead and the people follow, praise the Lord. Oh, when the leaders lead and the people follow, praise the Lord. Oh. Oh, when there's power in the pulpit and passion in the pews, ain't nothing that the church can't do when the leaders lead and the people follow. Praise the Lord. Amen. Let's give the Lord a hand clap of praise. Amen. Amen. And Heavenly Father, every head bowed, every eye closed. Maybe you're here today. Maybe you just haven't crossed that line of faith yet and Your life's sort of been aimless and you're looking for direction. I just came to tell you this morning, if you'll ask Jesus to be the leader of your life, he'll give you joy that is unspeakable. He'll give you peace that passes understanding. And he can change your life today. If you're in this place today, today you'd like to say, this is my day, this is my moment. Would you raise your hand in this place right now? Amen. Thank you, God. Heavenly Father, we just thank you for that today, and we just thank you, Lord, for commitments today and new commitments today. And we give you praise for all that you've done and all that you're going to do. And we declare, Lord, that what we saw happen last week is only the beginning 
Eye has not seen. There's more pledges that are still going to come in. Ears have not heard, neither has it entered into the heart of man what God has prepared for those that love him. And all God's people said amen. Amen.